Hey guys, I'm Mark. Today I'm right down the street at a farm that belongs to a couple of friends of mine, Greg and Janelle. Greg has actually worked this farm and this orchard behind me for the past 40 years. And he's a self-taught farmer and he's acquired a lot of tips and tricks and know-how over the years. So today we're gonna go out into the orchard and talk about apples because apples are in peak season right now in the middle of October here in Maryland. So we're gonna go out and talk about them, how they're grown, some of his expertise when it comes to them, but we're also going to, we're gonna to touch on a couple of other different types of fruit trees that are planted out there as well, but we're gonna primarily focus on apples because tis the season. Uh, Greg and Janelle are actually looking at retirement right now. So they have this beautiful farm up for sale at the moment, as well as this gorgeous farmer's market that they have right down the street where they retail all of their produce out of. So if you're interested in looking at these properties, I will include contact information in the description of this video. But for right now, I think we're gonna just wait a little bit longer, see if this rain can, uh, can sort of filter off, and then we're gonna go out into the orchard and talk with Greg and hear what he has to say. All right, guys, so this is Greg, and Greg, how about you tell us a little bit about the history of this place and how you got started with all this, and maybe why? Well, it all began when I was young, 16. Mm -hmm. I started working here, and... So this was already an orchard? This was an orchard, and I started as a summer job, picking peaches. Is, and, that, a, is, that, a, is that an ideal summer job to have? It seems like... I hear that. I mean, I know they're fuzzy, so. No, at the time it was fine. It, it just, you know, something I enjoyed just being outside, working outside. Yeah. Uh, so, but it just kind of grew on me. Yeah. And over the years, it's just uh, really, I kind of took a real interest in it. Yeah. And also with the market that the farm was part of. Right. And because uh, it's not all just apples here and peaches it, and it's, yeah, it's all it kinds a, of stuff. A little that you bit sort of, of everything. Into. And uh, I just enjoyed it. Yeah. And that's basically the gist of it. It was just pretty well, simple. I just really liked it. It looks like a lot of work, like a tremendous amount of work. So if you're going to do it, you don't you really have to like it. Seems yes. Like. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there, there's little downtime in an orchard. Sure. A lot of people think that, uh, you know, you plant a tree, you pick the fruit and make the money. Yeah. It's a year around deal. Okay. It's, yeah. You're just not picking apples in the fall when they show up. No. Right. No. It's year round work. Okay. Well, yeah. how about uh, knowing what you know now, since you've been doing this since you're 16, you said, right? Yes. If somebody were interested in maybe starting an orchard for the first time, is there anything that you would suggest to them that they think about before they even pick up a shovel? What are some things that you would probably want to consider or be aware of before you kind of break ground with this whole idea? Well, the first thing I would really think about it would be where I'm going to, going to get rid of the crop. Yeah. You have to have a market. Yeah. That's first and foremost. Uh, after that is, do you really have the time yeah. And the energy to take on something like this. Because, because you're locked in. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a real commitment. It's a, a lifestyle. You have to want to do this. And it's not so much like tomatoes or corn or something that, well, I'll grow this for a year and we'll see how it goes. If you're planting an orchard, it's a commitment that lasts much longer than, you know, one season. I mean, you're looking at something that's the next decade or two. Yeah, possible, possibly. It, yes, it is perennial, uh, no doubt. Uh, so you have to look at that as well because you don't plant a tree and harvest that crop the same year. Yeah. So you're looking three, four, five years ahead. So there's a lot of other stuff you probably want to keep in the ground in the meantime. Yeah, you might want to have, you know, another source of income or uh, maybe work in with some vegetables or whatever that can fill in during the time until your orchard, you know, becomes uh, fruitful. If you were going to start tomorrow on a brand new piece of ground <clears throat> and you knew you were going to plant apple trees, you knew you were going to plant an orchard, what, what do you think you would grow as an annual crop to supplement, I guess, uh, during the starting first couple of years? So well, you nothing mean getting here. the ground prepared? Yeah, you're getting the ground. Well, if you're, um, 
you know, because you can't sell your apples or your peaches right away, right? Because you just planted your trees. Mm -hmm. So you got to grow something else in the interim. What would be a good thing to also start with? Well, I mean, you've got to find something that's, once again, that you have interest in and have an ability to sell. Mm -hmm. uh, possibly at a local farmer's market or your own roadside stand. It could be anything. You could grow tomatoes, squash, sweet corn, melons, whatever, you know, fits your area that you're you're growing in i guess it's a that's a lot of it is trying to look at what's already out there and look at what's uh flooding the local farmers market yeah, already and, and it's just kind of eyeing up the competition that's there yeah, and help and you make those could, kind of decisions could be a good idea to maybe find something a little different mm -hmm. you know i mean if you're doing a market that's in a city you can look at uh you know what what uh type of foods that are you know being wanted there ethnicity mm -hmm. you know a lot of ethnic foods are really big and popular now sure so that can uh be your niche yeah so absolutely okay well um getting back <clears throat> to the trees if again from the perspective of somebody that was just going to be starting out are some fruit trees easier to grow than others like would you recommend starting with one type of tree and then for any, for whatever reason, I mean, you know, you should start with apples and once you kind of get the hang of it, then graduate to peaches and then, you know, cherries are really tough. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, yeah, is there like I a... think uh, maybe vice versa. The, the peaches may be a little simpler mm -hmm. to start. Apples require a little more uh, work. Uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, peaches can be a little more lucrative than the apples, but Apples, there's something about apples. Uh, and it's kind of like a all-American type of thing. You there's know? an allure Johnny to Appleseed. It for, yeah, okay? for sure. So you, you, you got that. And it's everybody loves the, the uh, time of the year with yeah, apples. Absolutely. So it's, well, I'm just standing here right now. And, I mean, you see behind us, these trees are just dripping with apples. And it's just the smell of them on the ground. And uh, like the be, I mean, it, it all, it's all part of the picture here. Right. Are they usually like this? Do you usually have this many apples? Or I mean, is this, a, you were saying uh, this is a pretty good year, but how? In uh, the past 40 years, this is probably the best, best and biggest crop of fruit I've ever seen. That's amazing. And the, is it all like that? Is it pretty much most varieties across the board? Or, uh, I mean, it's just it's as a whole? been fruit. I don't think it matters what type of fruit it's been this season. It's all been just okay unbelievable so not just apples but cherries and cherries and peaches, peaches plums nectarines even the the acorns the oak trees in the in the woods yeah are chock full of acorns i haven't noticed that so yeah. it's something this year uh last year was very minimal we had a very light crop Okay. Of everything we had a little problem with late frost yes and we uh, had next to nothing in blueberries last year because all the blossoms got burnt by that late frost right. so that may be a reason i really can't answer it i've never seen nothing like this ever yeah it's it's really something i, I mean it's, i'm surprised these trees are still upright really with all the weight that's on them um in terms of i guess the orchard itself and what's sitting here. And again, I, I'm getting back to this thing about planting an orchard and starting it off with, I think it's a good way to kind of introduce uh, the front end of this video. But if you're gonna plant an orchard, is there a specific, let's say you have a farm and you're gonna be planting two acres of orchard. Is there a specific part of that farm that you would wanna look for that has attributes like elevation or slope or drainage or like- Absolutely, all of the above. Okay. First and foremost is, a frost free or maybe not frost free but uh elevated ground tends to be less tendency to have frost because the frost it settles down settles in the low areas all right wind is at the high areas so generally air movement mm -hmm. also is okay. important yeah because that helps with like bacterial and fungal things it helps with it helps with everything okay uh so that's paramount all right. Okay. First and foremost is and the the frost is that really is that really the main reason for that is the uh, the blossoms and and that's, getting frost on the blossoms could that be the biggest damage that frost would do or that is, is the that's pretty much it it's yeah. uh, you know it's it's pretty detrimental uh, at certain times you know trees can are 
tend to be pretty hardy. It's just when they're in full bloom is when they're very it's tender. Just, yeah. It's a frost. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, you breathe them the wrong way, and that that's that's that little window where you uh, got to be delicate with them. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Right. Uh, before you go ahead planting, do you do anything to the ground itself? I mean, do you add like, do you add like uh, organic matter to the soil or, or anything? Is that, have you heard, I mean, I know you said you've got a group of peach trees down there that you were talking to me the other day about that weren't intended for peach trees. There's something else there, but you had put down mushroom soil and it's unbelievable the difference between those peach trees and some of the ones that were grown without Yeah, it, but yeah. It, the soil is where everything's at. Yeah. You know, that's where, that's where you begin. Mm -hmm. So you can do it in different ways. You can start with uh, different uh, green manure crops. You know, a lot okay. of people plant buckwheat or uh, a rape or something similar to get rid of the nematodes in the ground. Uh, it also builds the soil. Would you want to do that over the course of a couple seasons, maybe, ideally? or Prior to, yes. It would help with uh, building the soil, getting rid of, rid of the the uh, nematodes in the soil and it also helps with uh, getting rid of some of the weed pressure that can yeah. happen in the future yeah so that's really important okay the nematodes i know with with like tomatoes nematodes will chew on the roots mm -hmm. and they'll open the plant up to like fusarium and things like mm -hmm. that is that kind of the same it's situation the same with... situation yes. all right mm -hmm. that's interesting all right um well as far as the style goes now i know I know there seems to be a lot of different ways to grow apples uh, in particular. Uh, you've, I've seen these these big trees with guys on ladders, and then I see these little densely planted trees on trellises that are like, the the aisles are almost like as wide as my spread there. So would you see like an advantage or disadvantage to some methods or what's kind of like maybe an older way versus new age? Or can you well, explain in, that a little bit? The old time when I first started working here, mm -hmm. the trees were... 25 feet tall okay. okay 50 trees to an acre so definitely need several ladders and it was ladder work ladder work ladder work so okay. uh, that basically relates to more labor more time spent yeah so over the years they've you know the universities have that are into the tree fruit uh, they have developed all of these dwarfing rootstocks and we spend very little time on a ladder now. So most of your work is on the ground and that's just huge. And yeah, because you're not just talking about picking the apples, but you're also talking about, there's there's several different waves, I would think, of major work that needs to be done to an orchard. I mean, you got what pruning in the winter time and then do you, you thin out the blossoms or the young fruit so that so that you wind up having bigger individual fruit, and then and then you got your harvest later on. It's, Leave alone the entire, uh, you know, if you're dealing with uh, pests and all that kind of stuff. However, you're dealing with that. It's um, all of the above. Just, all of that is, you know, minimized with the the smaller trees. So you said rootstock, and that's a big thing about how these guys are controlled. It's not just pruning them and keeping them small that way. It's also the actual rootstock that they're grafted to. And that's, that's where a lot of development, you think, is in, in developing also, is it equal parts, you know, new varieties as well as new rootstocks or helping this technology kind of evolve as far as apples go? Or? Absolutely. I, I don't, I'm pretty sure that the, the rootstock development, it will never stop. Yeah. They're always improving. Yeah. Uh, size control, pest control, uh, you know, uh, fire blight, a just, host of things. Just resistance to all kinds of different all, pathogens yes. that might affect it. Yes, okay. exactly. Well, you know, well said there. It's, it's, uh, that's what it's all about. That's yeah. what the rootstock's all about. Just, yeah, keep making a stronger tree and, and, and then controlling the size. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, in terms of getting rootstock and starting off, I mean, how do your, how do your trees, how do most people, if you're going to get a nursery, I mean, a, um, an orchard together, how would you, go about getting your rootstock and your scions or the or the, the scion is first of all that's the um that's the part of the tree that bears the type of fruit that you're looking for right yes so for if you don't if you're not aware of what we're talking about um you have a cutting or a um a scion a tissue of the the tree that bears the fruit that you want grafted onto the roots of another 
type of tree, another variety that is grown specifically for its roots and everything you just said, its uh, resistance to uh, different pathogens yeah, and controlling the size of the eventual tree. So if you're going to get these trees that you're going to plant, are they already grafted in a lot of cases? Or do you buy the root stocks as saplings and then graft them yourself? Or, I mean, are there some options there? I think the majority of the uh, people will buy their trees already grafted from a nursery that specializes in doing so. Okay. So it's... Uh, do they come in pots or do they come, is they all bare root for the most they, part? They're generally bare root. All right. Uh, and always a good idea because these, a lot of these nurseries grow to order or uh, you need to think about what you want to do mm -hmm. in advance. This is not something you... Just scramble together in yeah, uh, November you, and then here you are placing your order in January. Exactly. It's, yeah. It requires some thought and, and pre-planning. Okay. So in terms of... Well, let's talk, let's talk about that for a little bit. In terms of planning what you're going to grow, the specific varieties and, and whatnot... How do you figure all that out? I mean, do you call the extension service and do they recommend different varieties or do you just like scout out different um, orchards and taste their product and just say, hey, I like this? Or how, I mean, how do you, because this is a pretty big commitment. I, you're not just planting like two or three trees of one variety, you're planting a whole row. Yeah, well, you, you got to go with what's trending. Yeah. And I mean, that's first and foremost. Okay. Uh, you know, what, what's trending right now is honey crisp. Crisp, you know, all, the crisp all, stuff. all these crisp apples, these yeah. crisp varieties, they are what the people are wanting now. So that would be a good place to start. Okay. Uh, How would you find out what's trending? Are there like blogs or different things that you can find this sort of literature I online? I would imagine or just word of mouth so. Or? That's not my kind of thing. But yeah. it's, uh, you know, if you're in the business, you you know you hear about it yeah you know there's there's publications fruit grower publications and the universities through the extension services are an excellent source okay to find out what's going on and the and the universities themselves you had mentioned are doing developing they're 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 sort of at the forefront of a lot of this aren't they i mean when i when i did some a little bit of research and a little bit of homework Prior to our conversation, I was looking at some of these different apple varieties, and it seemed like almost every one was, this one came out of this university. This one was developed by this university in 1994 or what have you. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so I guess just go straight to the source if you can, if they have a way of, uh, of reaching. Oh, the yeah, they're, they, they're a wealth of information. Okay. All right. Um, I guess trending, that's, that's important, too. Um, if it's if an apple is trending and and it only has maybe what five ten years in some cases before it's completely obsolete, then it probably also helps to have some of these smaller trees. I would imagine because then you can get them out of the way and plant something new behind it. In, in terms of like, uh, in contrast to planting trees that are going to get twenty feet tall, and anticipating having a twenty year life. I mean, I guess everybody in a perfect world would expect that twenty year thirty year life out of a tree to be a good reliable producer and a good marketable apple but it seems like the style of growing if you're gonna have smaller trees they're also easier to get rid of if you want to replace them with something if else. you want Is to that... look at it like that Mark. i would say i mean it's just uh i think if you're going to plant an orchard uh change is change is not something you want to really be thinking about yeah. in the future you want to be a little more optimistic than that a again. little little bit maybe just a tad all right but it Change does happen. I have planted uh, certain rootstocks of trees here that just didn't work for me. Yeah. And they're gone. They've been replaced. How many different rootstocks do you think, do you use like a whole bunch of different ones or do you, you have like two or three that you really like? Uh, right now with this size tree, it's it's a, uh, a, a pretty dwarfing rootstock. Uh, B9. Okay. Is is what it is, and and uh, would you stick to that for most things? Let's say if you're going to plant in, you know, uh, twenty more rows this year, would you put them all on B9 rootstock? Uh, that that or some of the newer uh, comparable rootstocks. There's some okay. other ones. I'm not really up to date on all the rootstocks. Sure, uh, but that's something again that you go back to university and stuff. Yeah, and there's and... there's a lot more. There's some newer ones coming out. Okay, uh, but most of mine here are on the the nines. I do have some on twenty sixes. They are 
B B twenty six. That's it. No, that would be an M. M M twenty six. M twenty six, and uh, that's a little larger tree, okay. and it's uh, pretty much freestanding, so which is can be important as well. Some would say not, but in my case here, it is. Okay. Uh, the, so that means not having to use a trellis. Exactly. Okay. So so it's just easier. It's an easier investment probably to not have to build the trellis. and. It's a little simpler, but then again, you know, when you're going with these larger trees, there also is a longer time to, you know, getting a crop. Okay. Okay. Typically what it would be maybe like five years on something like this? Not or? on these, on these B9s, they try to produce an apple darn near the year you plant them. Really? Yes. So year number two, you know, you plant them in the spring and you grow them for that summer. The next year, they're gonna really try to have a crop. That's one of the benefits of them. Huh. But there's also a little problem with that. You need to grow the tree. So you grow the tree first, not the fruit because if you let it have fruit it'll it'll dwarf it it, it uh, won't put as much energy into vertical growth and yeah you want to grow your your mm -hmm. your tree first it's it's that simple it's it's uh that makes sense that's kind of like with strawberries the first year you don't you'd like to pick all the blossoms off people say i've heard on the Is old that, way yeah the old, the old way, way of growing berries yeah mm -hmm, the matted row system but uh yeah you want to keep the fruit to a minimum, it's not. It's not going to hurt to leave a few on, sure. So you can and you're taste be, test or yeah, whatever. Get excited about but it you anyway. don't want a crop like this. Yeah, it's young, weak branches that are going to break your whole tree down. So you need to grow the tree. Okay. Uh, so, but when you have the larger trees, you're looking at a longer time. Is it? Do you, can you? Do we have an example of this row back here? Is that? Is that? Are they that much larger because they're on a different rootstock? No, that's or is the that same just a different variety that's a, the different variety mm -hmm. uh varieties tend to have different vigor so you can put them on a rootstock uh -huh. and this variety here is stamen yes. okay and you can see the size of the tree planted sure. the same day as that tree over there yeah which is a crispin slash mutsu uh-huh it's just much more vigor in the tree yeah. And the variety. Okay. So it's something you need to think about because sometimes if you're looking for certain spacing or whatnot, you don't always put the same uh, rootstock in your whole orchard. You can change rootstocks to uh, fill the space. Okay. okay? So, so this would be an example of if you wanted to have these trees this size and you also wanted to have that row the same size, Maybe use a different rootstock on that tree because that tree has more vigor than this one. Yeah. Use a rootstock that would that would make it even dwarfer. You would try if, to make that tree smaller mm. to be like this. Okay. But it's not always. It's not always going to line it's up. It's not always. That, it's it's not always capable. Especially when the research is usually pretty young. Right. A lot of these new varieties. Right. Yeah. And sometimes vice versa. You got varieties that are have no vigor. Mm. Okay, they don't want to get any real size to them, and you actually have to go to a rootstock that, that pushes them along, pushes a little them, farther. makes them a little bigger tree. Okay, Red Delicious is a prime example of that. It does not like to get a, a really decent size, huh. so you have to upsize on the rootstock. That's an older variety, isn't it? Red Delicious was that a staple for a long time? Yeah, it's been around a long time. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, you would think some of these older trees might have a little bit more. Uh, growth to them. That surprises me that that's, a, that's it, a smaller type tree. It's just the nature of the, you know, that variety. You yeah. know, every one variety is an individual and it has, grows differently. You had mentioned before that um, this is a really good year, whereas last year wasn't so much a good year. And we had talked about that in the past, that apple trees, a lot of the times, will work like a biennial almost. They'll, they'll produce a big harvest and then a smaller one and then a big one and then a smaller one. Um, could you plan for that? Let's say in terms of how you plant your orchard, uh, would you want to plant, if I knew that I was going to plant uh, 400 trees and that's all I had space for, would I want to plant 200 
in year A and then the next 200 in year B, would that have any effect at all or maybe? No, I don't think that would be the way to approach it. Yeah. And honestly, I don't think it's something to worry about terribly. I mean, it's, it's apples are like that, not all varieties. Mm -hmm. uh, your galas uh, tend to be pretty good producers year in and year out. Uh, a lot of your older varieties, the Golden Delicious, uh, Crispin, this Crispin, because it's it's got golden in it. It's uh, uh, also very biennial, but there is there are ways to get around it, yeah. and to get around it is to thin it. If you make the tree have less of a crop. Yeah. Then you're time kind of working towards having that crop again the following year. It sort of saves some of its resources. It doesn't yeah, put everything else it has out. Yes, I yeah. see, you could say it is something like that. But a year like this, when the crop is so huge, it's really really hard to deal with. Yeah. So we will have some. We'll there'll be less production next year. You can almost be certain yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. I guess having a lot of diversity is probably one of the main ways that you combat a lot of that. I mean, you said you've got over over 30 different kinds of apples, almost 40, maybe more than 40. I forget, we counted them. But yeah, there's a lot. There's uh, <laughs> they, Wherever one's uh, slacking, I guess, another one can kind of make up for it. It's sort of like not, not putting all your eggs in one basket in that respect. Yeah, one year you're gonna have, you know, a, say a good crop of stamen, Mm -hmm. or a good crop of golden or whatever sure. but then the next year you're not you're going to fill in with the galas yeah. or the brayburns or you know empire something else he's always, always got something yeah always got something on the burn yeah. or something to enjoy okay well um i guess you got so you have your uh you have your orchard planted you got it figured out it's here all right now in terms of like maintenance that's the big thing right because it's uh we talked about there's there's a few big phases of work where it's just like right now I'm interrupting a massive harvest where typically that's sort of what you guys seems like have been doing day in and day out mm -hmm. here recently. But there's a few phases of that, right? Like you got pruning in the winter to start with, I would imagine. Yeah. Every right? season there, there's, there's uh, a different aspect of what you're doing with the, with the orchard in general. It's, it's uh, right now, like you said, it's harvest. Mm -hmm. Okay. And once harvest is done, then we are going to be moving into pruning. Pruning is generally done. I, we start here when the leaves are off the trees. Right, that early. That okay. early. As soon as the leaves drop, we start. And we generally start on our older trees, more mature trees. And it can be as early as December 1st. So we start pruning. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you got a long winter. You got days where you can't be out there. It's brutal cold or, mm -hmm. you know, two feet of snow or whatever. So you got to get it done when you can get it done. Sure. So it's a long period of time. Okay. We start pruning December 1st, and we generally are not done in the orchard, not typically the apples, but with the peaches and whatnot, until April. Yeah. So it's, it's just that's a long time. You're just you're just pecking, pecking, pecking away at it as you can. That's a, that's Wait, you got a lot of other things to do around here too. It's not yes. just you know you gotta you gotta change oil and sharpen your blades and there's you know a million mm -hmm. of those kinds of things yeah. obviously too. Um, all right. So then you so then you prune. Do you use um, you're saying before something about an air pruner or do you use loppers or what are the different kinds of ways yeah. that you'll get out of here and. I've used air pruners in the past, and I just don't care for them. I'm, a, I'm old school. So the air pruner, that's that's a pruner that's attached to an air hose, to a, to an air compressor, right? At, at, a, exactly, a, yeah. That's just not, you know, I grew up with a pair of loppers. And you're just so used to it by I now. I like a pair of loppers, so I'm just, that's just me. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the new, uh, there's new ones out there, they're all battery-powered. Okay. So they look a little interesting to me, and because you're not attached to anything, you're not attached to anything. Mm -hmm. and Do they have electric ones on a cord? Uh, the corded ones, maybe too. I would think. Yeah, maybe, possibly. but I see that would be kind of detrimental. Yeah, because it would be the same thing as might as well get the air yeah, one then, right? Yeah. So, but uh, you know, there's some new things out there, but uh, you know, I'm I'm old school, yeah. so I do it the old-fashioned way. 
Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, so you got you got pruning, and then what's the next step after pruning? Do you have once the flowers all come out? That's now we're talking April, right? Yeah. And getting into spring, and then do you thin the flowers themselves, or do you wait for fruit to appear, or uh, is that? I mean, I know that's that's probably the next big step in terms of maintenance as far as the orchard goes. Is you prune during the winter time, and then there's like the there's like the step of, of thinning out the fruit so that. Yeah. The, um, on our we're a smaller orchard uh you know it's it's we do a lot of things by hand mm -hmm. so most of our thinning here is is done by hand so yeah. you know it's precise we know exactly what we have when we're done and uh that's what we do here there there are other ways but uh that's how we do it here i would imagine you don't have such a big window with that as you did with pruning like no, there might there's there it's a pretty big window it's just you don't have to do it when the flowers are on the tree you can no. do it at any stage where the fruit's kind of little no there's ways of of you know they're, they're coming up with ways of trying to get flowers off of trees uh and there's there's different approaches for apples as opposed to peaches but uh you know doing it by hand you, you got to wait to see what you got yeah. So you don't want to start too soon. Yeah, that makes okay, sense. Okay, you got to get past that frost. Okay, right. if, you know, if there's always the possibility of frost. You don't want to take all your product, your your crop off, and then have a frost. And, and then knock it down another fifty percent or eighty percent. Yes, yeah. yes. So you want to wait for that, and uh, and you know you work it in as long. We thin apples into July. So okay. there's, the apples are starting to get a little bit of size to them. So we, here are in, in our orchard, we thin the peaches before the apples. Okay. So Just, well, it's an earlier crop, too. It's, so it's an earlier crop, faster. so we start on the early peaches, and we do those first, and then we, you know, follow up with apples. Okay. One thing I forgot to mention, back in the pruning department, uh, we had talked about, you told me something interesting the other day, that you prune cherry trees at a different time of year. Typically all the peach trees, apples, all that, um, uh, nectarines, plums, that all gets pruned in the wintertime, but cherries you do? In the, after harvest. In the, after harvest. After harvest. Because of how it, it, it heals back up again pretty quickly? Yeah, or? you're looking at a time of the year where there's less moisture, it's drier. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. gives the, you know, every time you prune, you're cre creating a wound or an open channel for disease to get into the tree. Mm -hmm. You want it to heal quickly. So a time of the year when it's dry, when it's dry, wounds heal fast. Yeah. So, uh, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That's when we, we do it. And we're kind of minimalist when it comes to pruning cherries. I don't like to prune cherries very hard just because of the disease pressure. Okay, so, yeah, the, the less is more, just kind of yes, let them let them yep. sort of be. And that's that's canker, right? That's just something that gets in through the, and cherry trees in particular yes. uh, mm -hmm. really get affected by that badly. Yeah, cherries, cherry trees, typically, it's like they wanna die. It's, <laughs> yeah, that, they're that's just very simple. temperamental. They're, they are, and it's, yeah. you, you, you gotta fight to keep them going. Are some cherries in this area more resilient than others? In terms of types of cherries, are they all pretty much are sour cherries easier to grow than sweet cherries? Or my, they the, always say sour cherries would be easier. You know, uh, they're self-fertile. Mm -hmm. Most of your sweet cherries are not require you know Multiple other varieties, varieties yeah. that are blooming mm -hmm. the same time. The more the better. Okay. Uh, but once again, you know, some cherries do better in certain regions than others. It's like yeah. everything else. Okay. Well, we'll get back to apples, I guess. Uh, you know, you're, you're wearing the peak of season that we mentioned right now, you would say, probably. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. When it's does the, October. Well, yeah. when, does the, when does the season start? Like, when do, you, when do your earliest apples start showing up? Here, our earliest apple is the beginning of August. Okay. Some orchards wow. start earlier. They start in July. Uh, wow. Those earlier apples have kind of, they don't have a lot of consumer interest anymore. So, but... August is when we start, and we don't finish picking here until early November. Okay, so it, it is, it's a larger window than what I thought. Yeah, it's not, but peaches are large, or even larger than that. You can have 
the, the earliest of peaches go to the latest of peaches and there's a larger time window. You're saying in between that, then there is apples are sort of more of a condensed. Yeah, with peaches, and see. that's kind of recent as well. When I was young and started, peach season really didn't start until the freestones were available. Red Haven being your typical mm -hmm. number one peach, that was where we started, and that's generally around the first of August. Uh, once again, you know, the breeders have come up with a lot of really interesting and pretty darn good peaches that start the end of June. Yeah. And, uh, but they are clings or, you know. So what's the difference between a cling and a freestone? Is it the way the seed is inside the? It's the way the flesh of the peach uh, releases from the seed. Some okay. don't, clings don't. Clings the, that little shell, is that what, when it sticks to the flesh of the peach really hard and you have to kind of pry it off of there or it almost, almost cut it off? It doesn't come off. Yeah, Yeah. But I see. Yeah, so there's some that are cling, some that are semi-free stone. So as they get, when they're more on the harder side, they cling to the seed, but as they get ripe, they will come off. Okay. And then there's the true free stones later, generally August, that are, you know, break right away from the seed. Huh. So, but the problem is, is, you know, a lot of your old timers and then uh, they're kind of set in their ways with freestone peaches. They're not used to a lot of these new varieties. Mm -hmm. They still have a lot to offer. They're still a peach. They still yeah. taste good. You know, they still cut up good. They still make great desserts, but sure. they just don't come off the seed. Yeah. Well, I guess that's a that's a big thing if you're going to be processing peaches, I, like canning, or if you're going to be freezing them or putting yeah. a whole bunch of them away. Yeah. So if uh, you're going to do that, wait for the freestone peaches. Okay. But if you really like peaches, mm -hmm. why avoid the early ones? Uh, yeah, I, lo I love enjoy peaches. Enjoy them while they're here. Uh, well, I think I'm going to enjoy some apples, and uh, I think I'll let you get back to enjoying your harvest. <laughs> you obviously have a lot to work with, and uh, I just... Really appreciate you the time, taking the time to talk to us and explain your place. And, um, you know, it's a little bit about what it's all about. If you, uh, let me ask you, Greg, if you had to do it all over again, is there anything mainly you could think about right off the bat you do a little bit differently? I don't know if I would do anything really different. You know, there's going to be a few things you would not do and what you would rather do. But in general, the the whole deal, the whole it's a lifestyle. Yeah. It's it it's uh very enjoyable. You can really see what you've done. You know, yeah. I mean, look at these trees. We planted them. I, this variety here, 15, 16 years ago, and it was just a stick in the ground. Yeah. And look at it now. Yeah. I, and that's. I, you know, so that's what makes it all. That's what puts a smile on your face. And sure, it's it's something you accomplished and you did, and and uh, you know you got to feel good about that. Absolutely. Yeah. If you do it right, you do it the great way. You've got only yourself to give credit to, and if you do it wrong, you got only yourself to blame. It's that's, uh, that's right. That's an interesting and very free, I think, yeah. way to live. Yeah. Okay, right. Greg. Well, well, thank you so much again. I think we can conclude it there. <laughs> all right, man. All right, Mark. Well, Thanks, it was fun. Thank you guys so much for watching our video. I hope you liked it. If you have not subscribed to the channel yet, please do. It helps out the channel greatly. It gets the videos up in front of more people. But for now, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you liked it, and we'll see you next time. Wait a minute, guys. We're not done yet. We're going to do a little side note. We came down here. These are some special apple trees, and they are made apparently for cider. Um, cider used to be very popular in the United States I think prior to the prohibition, but now it's kind of like coming back. And these trees, some of these cultivars are very old trees from what I understand. And um, they were, they used to be used for cider. And now it's kind of a, sort of a, an experiment going on here at the nursery of uh, bringing some of them back. But they're, they're very interesting. Some of them are small. Some of them are really ugly skins on them, um, but they're just very different. The flavor of this one, it's sour, but very nice. It's tart, but it's really, really good. It's kind of got a little sweetness to it. Yeah. A little bit. 
So you got a little sweet flavor. Yeah, Holly wants one. There you go. Who you can try. pick your own? There's a zillion apples around. Uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of these varieties go back to the uh, you know 1700s. Thomas Jefferson here. He was a huge hard cider producer. It's amazing. So, you know, that was their drink of choice back then. Well, some of them, they're not... I mean, you could tell that they're not meant, not not necessarily this one, because this one's delicious, but uh, there's a couple that I tried that they have like more of almost like an astringent flavor to them. They're not meant for eating fresh. They're meant for <laughs> making that dry yeah. cider. Yeah, they're actually terrible <laughs> to eat. They're uh, pretty awful, but they make a, you know, a pretty decent cider. Okay. Well, that's an interesting side note. Definitely wanted to mention that to you guys. While we're out here, though, I did want to show you... Uh, these peach trees over here, I mean, look at how green they are. This is where, this is where you were talking about you laid the mushroom soil down because you were going to grow one thing here and then you changed your mind. Yeah, eventually this was, this, this piece of ground was used for vegetable production and it kind of got thrown into the uh, growing peaches. And also, these trees were planted in 2018 as well, same as these apples. These are three-year-old trees. And How big were they when they were, got planted in the ground? They were just a stick. Just whips, little whips. Just whip. whips, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Three years. Are they and producing fruit yet? They had a wonderful crop of peaches this year, first crop. <laughs> That's amazing. Gigantic crop of peaches. That's fantastic. That variety right there is called August Rose. It's a white peach. And it okay. gets rather large. So everything about this tree is big. Yes. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, Greg. Sure thing. <laughs>